Tourette syndrome is a rare genetic disorder that causes neurological and developmental impairments. It affects the way the brain develops, causing a progressive inability to use muscles for eye and body movement and speech. It occurs almost exclusively in girls, and most babies with Rett syndrome will seem to develop normally at first, but after about six months of age, they lose the motor skills they once had. This documentary will give a brief overview of Rett syndrome, how development and motor skills are affected through each stage of Rett syndrome, the effects Rett syndrome has on the body, research being conducted, and the therapy options for those with Rett syndrome. Rett syndrome is a neurological disorder that appears shortly after birth around 6 to 18 months. It is commonly misdiagnosed as autism, cerebral palsy, or developmental delay. It is caused by a mutation on the X chromosome, specifically on a gene called MECP2. Rett syndrome almost always affects females. It rarely affects males. It affects 1 in 10,000 females. It is not a degenerative disorder. Rett syndrome causes problems in brain function that are responsible for cognitive, sensory, emotional, motor, and autonomic function. These can include learning, speech, sensory, mood, movement, breathing, cardiac function, and even chewing, swallowing, and digestion. When Rett syndrome occurs, there is usually a stagnation in development and skills. They may start to lose some functions such as communication or control of their hands. They may start making unusual hand gestures. During the early years, they may feel irritated and cry. They can also have abnormal growth. Their head growth can slow, can slow and they can form a curve in their spine. They may also have sleep disturbances. Red syndrome can cause seizures and issues with breathing as well. In some cases, motor problems may worsen, but usually improve as they become less irritated. The symptoms differ from person to person. With therapy and family, those suffering from Red Syndrome can partic participate in school and co community events. Red Syndrome hasn't been proven to shorten lifespan. The development of Red Syndrome consists of four stages across the lifespan. Early onset stage, rapid destruction stage, plateau stage, and late motor deterioration stage. The first stage is known as the early onset stage. Signs and symptoms are not very pronounced at this time, which usually leads to them being easily overlooked and often go undetected. Early onset typically starts between 6 to 18 months of age and usually lasts somewhere between a few months to a year in duration. Here, development stalls or stops completely. Common milestones include the infant showing less eye contact, as well as losing interest in toys or objects. Delays in basic movements or postures, such as crawling or sitting, are also observed during this stage. The second stage is called, rapid, is called the rapid destruction stage. This usually occurs between the ages of 1 to 4. In this stage, children seem to lose the ability to perform previously acquired skills. The progression of this can have either an acute or gradual onset, which can span over weeks to even months depending on the situation. Symptoms of this stage include slowed head growth, abnormal hand movements such as ringing and hand washing gestures, clapping and the tapping of hands. Others include hyperventilating, screaming or crying without reason, abnormal coordination and movement patterns, as well as loss of social interaction and communication with others. The third stage is known as the plateau stage. This usually occurs between ages 2 to 10 and commonly lasts for years. Individuals during this phase exhibit a deceleration in regression and other problems. Behavior may have limited improvement with less crying and irritability as well as some improvement in abnormal hand gestures and verbal communication. However, not all symptoms seem to dissipate to some degree, as seizures often begin to surface during this stage, but not usually before the age of two. Many people living with Rett syndrome tend to spend the majority of their lives in this stage. And the final stage of Rett syndrome is known as the late motor deterioration stage. This usually starts around the age of 10 and is capable of lasting for years or even decades. Loss of muscle tone is a predominant factor of this stage as it 
tends to lead to muscle weakness and in turn may lead to immobility in a lot of cases. Scoliosis tends to surface during this phase as well and in some cases can become severe enough to require braces and or surgery. Understanding, commu understanding communication and hand skills usually remain relatively stable or show slight improvement and the prevalence of seizures become more uncommon. People with Rett syndrome deal with flaccid muscles, inability to combine muscle movements, muscle weakness, fragile bones that are prone to fractures, problems with coordination, stiff muscles, or rhythmic muscle contractions. They tend to have repetitive behavior and most likely will have delayed development or failure to thrive. They will also lose the ability to communicate with other people due to their inability to speak and poor eye coordination. Rett syndrome is also very dangerous due to the symptoms they produce, such as seizures, irregular heartbeat, and dealing with the whole body they cannot control fully. Physically, they will never reach a full developed state, leaving them usually looking younger than they actually are, and scoliosis. Scoliosis is a sideways curvature of the spine. For normal people, if scoliosis were to occur, they happen during the growth spurt just before puberty. Though most cases have very few symptoms, sometimes if the condition is severe, they will use a brace or even go through surgery. The scoliosis in people with Rett syndrome is most likely due to poor muscle control, poor coordination, or an asymmetrical pull. This kind of scoliosis is considered to be neuromuscular or caused by the imbalance of the muscles of the spine. Sure. Uh, first, of all, first of all, my name is Mr. Um, Dr. Park. I have worked with students with disabilities since 2008 and I have a master's degree in adult physical education and also a doctorate degree in sports pedagogy. Um, some of my research interests include sports um, teaching, physical education to students with disabilities, and also adopted sports, working with adopted athletics. First of all, um, we, I think in our field, we prefer typical developments and atypical developments. So when you are thinking about typical developments for especially infants or children, um, there, there are very broad terms for that, but typically we are seeking a um, typical developments, meeting the you know, milestones, motor development milestones, movement milestones, um, what they are capable of in terms of um, motor skills, fine motor skills, large motor skills. When an infant or children miss the um, general milestone that is set for the you know, throughout the research, uh, if they're meeting that milestone, we can typically say, well, you know, they're on the typical patterns of motor developments. However, a student with, in, um, let's say, individual with the rest syndromes, they typically demonstrate or displays a normal developments through approximately about six months. And then they are usually, um, this rest syndrome is often misdiagnosed as well. And it's misdiagnosed as, you know, CP or autism or stuff like that. But usually, you know, parents will notice some um, delays within the developments. So, and that development such could include, you know, losing some of the locomotor skill, I mean, the mo uh, motor skills, fine motor skills, speech. Um, they, parents may notice that size of the head is not getting bigger. So that, that should throw a lot of you know, flags. And once again, for, a, for students to be properly evaluated, they must be taken to the pediatricians or the proper professionals. Muscular strength and endurance are pretty very important for um, a person to actually have a good posture or carry on everyday activity, activity for the life, right? But if, uh, if let's say a person with disability doesn't really have, a, have that, once again, that could be problematic for them to perform a walking or basic, if you think about an infant, they may not be able to support themselves, so they may have a poor postures, 
Um, they may not be able to crawl. They may not be able to, you know, uh, crib. Or, you know, it, it just kind of it sets delays for every little things that you can think of in terms of the motor skills. So, uh, for example, for a person with the rest syndrome, I think one of the main issues is that not being an amb ambulatory. Even though they may start walking and they may not, they may be able to crawl at the beginning. But as you may know, because of the rest, because of the rare disease, you know their skill level will decrease during the like during their lifespans. So as a, um, I think it's very important, even though important for them to work on their strength and endurance at a very early age. Um, early intervention has been proven. It has been proven to be very beneficial and effective. Well, there's no right or wrong answers to that because everybody will be different. It's, it's going to be a case by case. And what needs to be done at first is proper assessment. You have to formally assess the students and find out what the needs are. Obviously, some person with rest syndrome may have higher functionality compared to um, severe case of rest syndrome. Um, and then you have to individually design the lesson based on the information you gather from the assessment after consulting with other professionals and see what are the most um, what are, what are the most uh, I guess how about with this what would be the most beneficial workout let's say if that person is lacking with the under um, the lower body extremity strength and endurance um, those are something that you should be focusing on the, from the get-go and then try to improve it at, throughout the lifespans. If it's maybe upper body or maybe if it's just cardiovascular, um, just try to utilize a variety of physical activities or exercise as much as you can to improve that within their lifespans or within their, you know, within a year or two. Once again, this is very it varies depends on the you know ability level of the students or ability level ability level of the persons, but it has to be tailored and it has to be um, carefully planned, including a team of experts such as PT or doctors or other physical specialists. A variety of therapy options can be used to help manage and retain typical functioning. One type of therapy is occupational therapy. Since Rett syndrome is not a neurodegenerative disorder, improvements can be made over a lifespan. The goals of occupational therapy include encouraging the use of head, elbows, and other body parts over which she may have better control, maximizing hand use for functional activities, developing the ability to access communication devices, developing the ability to access a variety of assistive technology, improve her ability to assist with dressing, improve her ability to perform independ independent feeding skills, improve her ability to assist with grooming abilities, and improving her ability to tolerate sensory input in school settings. Occupational therapy can introduce the use of assistive devices. For example, splints can be used to position thumbs for grasping, and cusps, cuffs and loops can be used to assist with grasping as well. For apraxia and ataxia, occupational therapy can be useful as well. Apraxia is defined as the inability to perform particular purposive actions. Ataxia is the loss of full control of bodily movements. Weighted vests can be calming and decrease ataxia. The use of a therapy ball can also be helpful. Rotational and weight shift activities can also be used, and vestibular movements activities, if tolerated, can be used for balance and coordination. Occupational therapy can be used to manage spasticity, which is the continuous muscle con contractions. Crap. Occupational therapy can be used to manage spasticity, which is defined as continuous muscle contractions. Tone reduction activities are used, which include rotation, weight shifting, and vibration. These can help temporarily reduce spasticity. For scoliosis, it is important to position her properly to ensure symmetrical and erect position, posture in sitting. Physical therapy is another effective form of therapy for girls with Rett syndrome. The goals of physical therapy include 
maintaining or increasing motor skills, developing or maintaining transitional skills, preventing or reducing deformities, alleviating dis discomfort and irritability, and improving independence. A common dilemma that the physical therapist faces is that although improvements or lack of regression have been shown to happen in children and adults with Rett syndrome, they must also be careful not to push too hard because of her underlying neurological situation. Since Rett syndrome symptoms are always changing in the child, a very flexible approach to physical therapy is necessary. What works for a few months might suddenly stop working or no longer be possible for her. Physical therapy is a form of external facilitation, and since a child with Rett syndrome already lacks the ability to control her own movements, physical therapy can be particularly stressful to her. According to the Scientific World Journal, about 87% of those in physical therapy have a fear of movement, which impacts the effectiveness of her therapy. Active physiotherapy can also be used to treat a variety of her symptoms. Girls with Rett syndrome can have trouble breathing. Respiratory disturbances and cardiovascular disturbances are possible, such as periodic apnea. To help prevent these disturbances, her caretakers must ensure that she participates in motor activities, such as standing and walking, which will allow her to take deeper breaths and oxygenate her body better. Simply participating in fun and games that cause laughter will give her deeper breaths, and large arm movements give her deeper breaths and allow movement in the chest to be maintained. Dystonia, which is a state of sustained muscle contractions, can be managed by active physiotherapy as well. Dystonic tensions come and go and are most common in toes and feet. Having her stand and walk on her feet is the best way to maintain mobility of feet and toes. Good support such as custom shoes, orthoses, and standing frames help keep the feet in good posture. Asymmetry in the hips and pelvis is common because of unequal muscle activity and increased muscle tension that pulls the leg inward, which could cause hip dislocation and could also cause one leg to be shorter than the other due to continuous muscle tension. Postural control is often lacking in girls with Rett syndrome because of low muscle tone, which makes sitting upright difficult. Many girls with Rett syndrome lean when seating, seated. Postural control is often lacking in girls with Rett syndrome because of low muscle tone, which makes sitting upright difficult, and many girls with Rett syndrome lean when seated. Other types of helpful therapy for Rett syndrome include hydrotherapy, which is water therapy, and hippotherapy, which is horseback riding, and can be particularly helpful for strengthening the hips and mobility. The following is an interview of Christy Johnson, the mother of Nora, a nine-year-old girl who is suffering from Rett syndrome. Normal birth, um, and Nora developed normally up until three to six months. Some of the very first signs that we weren't really concerned at, about at the time were um, she would only roll over to one direction, and it would only be from her tummy to her back, and she was pretty delayed for sitting up. She didn't sit up until she was about nine months. First signs. Okay. And then we started really becoming worried at about a year, because she wasn't um, she wasn't pointing or gesturing her needs or wants, and she had regressed in a few um, of her skills, like her speech had regressed. She used to say "Mama, Dada," da, things like that, repeating us, and then she did that for about two weeks and stopped. And that was right about at nine to ten months. Yeah, Nora has a wheelchair, of course, and she can't walk around anymore. Even before she lost her ability to walk, she needed a wheelchair because she would get tired. Um, so she's had that for quite a while. Um, 
she has a special bed that has a netting all around it because she used to fall out of bed a lot. And she has a walker in the house and one at school she uses. She uses exercise bikes um, made for kids with special needs. She has a, I don't think I mentioned this last time, maybe I did. She has a, well, we have a wheelchair accessible van. Um, I don't know if that would count as equipment. Um, there's some other things. She has a bike trailer. It's a special bike trailer. And I think that's it. She has a, an eye gaze device for her communication as well called a Toby. Scientists are currently researching ways to cure Red Syndrome. The Gene Therapy Consortium is working to overcome the different challenges of gene therapy. One possible route is protein replacement. These involve delivering protein past the blood-brain barrier to the MECP2 gene. The blood-brain barrier is a protective interface that separates the brain and the circulatory system. This is a non-invasive procedure. The blood-brain barrier has particular receptors that allow nutrients to pass through. The scientists will target these same receptors to, to transport the protein to the brain. Scientists will fuse the molecules to the protein that allow it to be recognized and pumped across. The protein replacement approach will allow the protein to be titrated to a much greater degree than gene therapy. There are also several labs who are working on turning off the mutated MECP2 gene and turning on the healthy copy. In each cell, there are two copies of each gene. With Rett syndrome, the mutated gene is the active gene. Neither of these research projects are very far along, and there could be as adverse effects. So they have yet to determine if this is a safe and reliable course of action. Simple. Rett syndrome is caused by mutations of the MECP2 gene. But it turns out that every cell in your body carries two copies of the MECP2 gene, one of which is active and the other of which is inactivated or silent. So that means that if one of the two gene copies is mutated, then roughly half the cells in your body are carrying an active mutation of MECV2, and the other half of the cells have a, a normal copy of MECV2. So the approach that we're taking is to try to turn on the second backup copy of MECV2 with the expectation that if we can turn on the dormant copy of MECV2, this can replace functions that are lost in cells that are normally carrying the active mutation of MECV2. As it stands, Rett syndrome is currently an incurable condition, but research is actively pursuing the development of a potential cure for the future. A completely new approach to finding this cure is currently underway. Across the board, it has been found that the mutation of the MECP2 gene is the root cause of Rett syndrome. So the vast majority of research involves trying to manipulate this gene directly. However, according to McDonald and Kishi of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, 
They are looking to develop the solution by other means. Instead of concentrating mainly on the affected MECP2 gene, they emphasized focusing on the neurons that were known to be abnormal and implicated Rett syndrome along with other autism spectrum disorders. The neurons in, in focus of this study are called the interhemispheric colossal project, projection neurons, or CPNs for short. The defect they observed in these types of neurons are typically having shorter or less developed dendrites. They eventually used mice analogs to fluorescently label these CPNs. After doing this, they identified another gene called IRAC1 that is regulated by the well-known MECP2 gene. This newly discovered IRAC1 gene was observed to be making about three times more protein than usual. So eventually the IRAC1 levels were modified, which actually resulted in better dendrite development substantially, and the mice showed fewer symptoms and better overall function. Lifespan was also lengthened. This study is promising and could open the door for subsequent studies to expand upon this concept. An upcoming step now is to look into potential compounds and drugs that produce this effect or to investigate current drugs that already are available that could produce the same effect to correct this neural pathway. There is a lot of work that has yet to be done, but this sets solid groundwork for a way to pursue a Rett syndrome cure. Rett syndrome causes early developmental issues and affects motor development. Although girls with Rett syndrome may start to develop normally at first, a child with Rett syndrome will begin to regress over time, causing a loss of motor skills. There is no known cure for Rett syndrome at the moment, however, it can be managed by a variety of therapies and medical treatments. Rett syndrome is not a neurodegenerative disease, which gives hope that a person with this syndrome can improve their life over time and regain their skills that were once lost. Having a strong support group that is willing and able to take care for a child with Rett syndrome is necessary for her to regain as much of her independence and capabilities as possible. Because Rett syndrome is so rare and the public has little of knowledge of it, Research for better treatment options and finding a cure is often lacking. It is important to increase awareness of this condition in order to improve the quality of life for those suffering from Rett syndrome. As research and awareness continues to increase over time, forward steps can be taken to find better treatment options and possibly even a cure.